Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this breakout session of the Academic Libraries North Conference. Before we get started with our two short papers in this session, I'm just going to run through some quick housekeeping. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please do add them throughout the talks to the Q&A tab next to the chat box on Hubelow. No questions will be taken verbally, but any questions put in there will be passed on to our presenters. The whole session is being recorded. If you would like captions, you can turn them on yourself by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your stream window. We do ask all delegates to abide by the code of conduct, which can be accessed via the delegate brochure and the ALN website. So firstly, I'm going to hand over to Tom Vores from um, Leeds Trinity University for their short paper, Building Relationships, Creating a Library Partnerships Policy. Thank you, Tom. Um, hello, everyone. Um, hopefully you can all see my presentation OK. Um, I feel a bit like I'm after the Lord Mayor's um, show after Josh's um, inspiring presentation, but here we go. Um, hopefully this should be um, informative and interesting for those. Um, we're just going to be looking at how we help um, develop the relationship with our partners, um, our partner institutions that utilise Lee Trinity University Library resources and how we develop the partnership policy to help that. Um, so Lee Trinity University, um, it's a partnerships um, have been a relatively new thing for Lee Trinity University. They only started in 2019. Um, we have three different types of partnerships at the moment um, with local FE colleges, um, private UK higher education institutions and international universities. Um, the vast majority of student numbers and courses are with the private UK HE institutions around about I'd say 90% and our total, our partner student total is over 4,000 for this academic year, which is actually more than our on-campus students because we're a small, a relatively small institution. And um, this is planning to grow significantly over the next few academic years with a peak of around about 17,000 if predicted, if our partnerships continue to grow as we're planning on. Um, the majority of the partnerships are either doing um, business related courses, health or social care or computing. Um, so the partners themselves, the ones I'm going to talk about the most are our private UK partners and um, because they seem to have the most unique student profile. Um, they have a very different background compared to standard undergraduate students. Um, they're very often first generation migrants, English as a second language. The vast majority, around about 95% are mature students. Um, so they and, and a lot of them are doing it while in full-time employment or part-time employment and some are even asylum seekers as well and refugees so they're a very diverse group of students and therefore they have very different experiences and different needs of um, higher education so our partner students in 2020 21 nearly 83% entered the university via the partner um, with the lowest quintiles of development. Um, um, so that's quintiles one and two. So they're the most deprived. That's their eco socio status when they started the course. And comparing that to um, all English HE providers, that it was only 42.6%. So you can see it's double basically um in different so it's a very much a different student background and linked to that is they don't come with the vast majority don't have standard um further education qualifications they haven't got gcse's the a levels etc so there's perhaps a different route to higher education for these students so my role um partnerships librarian was created in august 2021 it was a brand new role um i previously worked in another um, ALN institution um, as a librarian, but I hadn't actually worked in partnerships before, so this was a new role for me. Um, so it was a full, I'm a full-time partnerships librarian and I'm focused on developing library resources and support materials for partners, staff and students um, and to liaise with stakeholders. So in terms of stakeholders, I mean um, partner, academic staff, um, LT, the Academic Partnerships Unit, which is a unit within the university that helps deliver these partnerships. Um, so previously, all this different support and different liaising was done by a full-time 
members of staff that had other full-time responsibilities. So it was very hard to get the capacity to fully support partners as much as we would like, because the theory was that these partner students should have an equitable experience to our normal LTU students, regardless of where they're studying from and their previous experience and background. So to help um, uniform the delivery of partnerships across all the different types of partners we've got, it was um, designed to, the partnership policy was designed to make it clear to uh, both us as the library ourselves and fellow library staff and partners who was responsible for what in terms of resource provision, um, academic support, academic skills support, referencing support, access issues, um, and it basically the whole delivery of um, library resources. Um, so we're trying to make the level of service consistent for each type of partnership um, as far as possible, because obviously there's caveats, for example, our local um, FE providers that we're partnered to do have access to our library to access print collections and can borrow print books. Meanwhile, our TNE, our international partners, obviously wouldn't have that provision available to them. So previously there was differing levels of support and that was simply due to lack of staff time and also lack of communication with the partners, lack of awareness of what the library is delivering and what they can deliver as well. So yeah, I think the key point of the policy was to make it clear of what we can deliver and where our limitations are. So yeah, it covers all the different partnerships types um, in terms of how these are delivered. Do students access via their VLE? Do they access via Open Athens, their resources? Um, do they access via the library website? Um, what, what exactly resources do you have a license for? And what, what other support can you get from the library? Um, we also, because partnerships, the, well, historically, the library was one of the last to know when a new partnership would come along. It would be a case of, um, oh, by the way, there's a partnership coming up in September, and this during the summer, the partnership coming up in September, they want access to these resources. I hope that's okay. Um, and so we try and figure out after the fact how we could do that. So the partnerships policy helped, helped us define the requirements for the library for part, planning new partnerships, i.e. number of students, what courses are they going to be studying? What resources do they require? if it costs X amount for this license, are they willing to fund it, et cetera? Or is it going to be funded within the fee they pay the university as a whole? Um, so the boundaries of Leeds Trinity University Library provision and the provision provided by partners themselves. So my role doesn't actually involve directly supporting the students in terms of information literacy skills, researching skills, but it does involve giving that kind of training to partner staff. Um, so and it's and so we're trying to understand, to make partners aware of what we are delivering and what they are required to deliver as a partner. As I mentioned before, the resource access methods for partners, so the different part way they can possibly access resources, um, whether they can get it directly via their Moodle or whether we have for our TNE at the moment we have to create um, individual Open Athens accounts for each um, individual student. Meanwhile, for our UK partners, we don't have to do that. So there's different ways people can access resources. Um, licensing costs, as I said, depending on what resources they require due to what courses they want, licensing costs will be prohibitive or it might be that the partner is not willing to pay for that because they might have their own library provision. That's one of the questions we ask do they have a library at their own institution? And if so, what do they have access to that's relevant to the courses they're wishing to study as a partner? And then the support provided by Lee Trinity University Library by myself and my colleagues. So the partnership policy was written as a first draft with myself and the director of the library. And then we shared it with it internally within the university's academic partnerships unit, um, got their approval. And then we shared it with the current partners to make sure they were happy with it and made sure they signed it and they'd seen it and they were happy with it. So then we could refer to it in future cases. Um, and it's going to be used to help guide the creation of our new partnerships, which are up and coming and pretty much 
const there's always constant queries, investigations, due diligent diligence um, done to investigate new partners. Um, and it is going on the library website, so it's accessible to all the partnerships policy. It can be referred directly to staff and students if they require it. We're currently in the process of building this new library website and it's going to go live at the end of the month. So that's when it will be visible. But um, at the end of the presentation, I have put a, a QR code and there is a link to the actual policy as well. So feel free if you're interested to have a look at it. Here we go, this is the link to it. Um, what else I wanted to say was that um, if you do have any questions about partnerships in general, we are trying to develop an Academic Libraries North partnership um, community of practice. I don't know if anyone's seen emails about it, but I'm currently going to be the co-chair, but I don't have a co with me at the moment. So if anyone is interested in becoming the co-chair or if they're just simply interested in becoming part of the group, um, please let me know because I'm more than happy to discuss with you about what, what we can, how we can share experiences and knowledge. Um, because from my experience, this is a area where each university seems to do it very differently. Um, not a lot of consistency in regards to how it's delivered and who delivers it. I think I'm in a very lucky position that I'm full time doing this because the vast majority of people I speak to have significant other responsibilities within the university library. Um, so yes, I am going to close this to see if there's any questions. How do I stop sharing? I'm trying to stop sharing now. How do I do that? Okay. I wasn't, there we go. Hi, Tom, I don't think we've had any questions through just yet. Um, if we do get any before the end of the session, we can always come back to them because we have um, probably got a little bit of time um, to do that. So I will let you know if any do come in before the end. So feel free to just still pop them into the Q&A um, tab if you do think of anything to ask Tom. Um, so thanks very much, Tom. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, so for the second of our two talks this morning, I'm going to hand over to Fran Porritt from Teesside University and Nicola Wiley from Lancaster um, for their short paper, Partnering to Support Wellbeing. So over to you, Fran and Nicola. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll just share my slides one second. Morning, everyone. Okay, that should be sharing now. Awesome, so um, I'm Nicola Wiley. I work at Lancaster University. Delighted to be joined by Fran Porritt from Teesside University. Um, so- Hi Nicola, I can't see your slides yet. I don't know if it's just me. Oh. I, can't, I can't see them either, I'm afraid. Oh, okay, let's have a, have a go again. That there we go, yet? I can see them now. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Got to have some technical difficulty. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're talking about partnering to support well-being and mental health today. So I'm going to start off by introducing a little bit of context. Um, so we've highlighted three sort of main things, um, starting with back in 2015, student mental health, uh, Student mental wellbeing, sorry, in higher education created a good practice guide. Um, and this report starts to outline what different universities should consider when sort of providing mental health support. Um, and moving to 2019, the University Mental Health Charter was published by Student Minds. So this was based on research conducted with university staff and students. Um, and it really aligns to a whole university approach to looking at this. Um, it's a key document for ongoing work with the University Mental Health Charter Award Accreditation Scheme, um, which some of your universities might have signed up to. Um, and most recently, of course, in the context of the pandemic, 
student minds again recognized that the pandemic didn't affect everyone equally um, and they created a resource called student space so um, that has a lot of kind of general information and guidance on that and it also has specialist guidance um, for groups such as Muslim students, trans students um, and more. Um, so I can share links to those if anyone is interested. Um, so that, that's a bit of context. Uh, Fran's got some more to add as well. So what we found um, last week reported on BBC news sites was a, a new report that had come out by an organisation called Human um, with a large sample of students, um, 7,200 students had been involved in this study. And it was found that 50% of students felt that their university had experience had been negatively impacted by mental health um, issues. Um, and also um, a very low percentage of staff, 4%, felt that they had received um, adequate training to help support students um, with their mental health. So we can see that it's a very large area that's having a huge impact upon um, the university experience overall. Um, and particularly, as Nicola mentioned, with the effect of the pandemic, we know that that um, has had a huge impact on students. So um, in light of the, the current agenda on health and wellbeing, two colleagues, um, Liz Brewster at Lancaster and Andrew Cox at Sheffield, decided that um, they wanted to do something more kind of practical for universities. So they put a call out, which some of you uh, might remember that going out, and formed a group, which is the ALN Mental Health and Wellbeing Project Group. Um, so on screen, I've got the current members um, which I hope represents the connectivity across our network. We've got a great spread um, of universities. Um, so we came together and we thought, what can we practically do to help universities in this space? So what the group have been doing over the, the months that been, we've been meeting at regular intervals um, is to create a resource to help all staff um, with the issues of providing mental health support in libraries and in their wider departments. Uh, so in my case, um, I'm part of student and library services, so it's wider than the library alone. Um, so the resource is, is built upon uh, the writings of um, um, uh, Andrew and Liz Brewster, um, and they've created um, some a, a really helpful resource that um, it's been a soft launch this week. Um, that we can see now that Nicola's um, screen sharing. The soft launch this week that's gone out to the, the reps at each of the institutions, the ALN institutions, uh, with a link so that you can request access to this resource. And hopefully that lots of, of you will uh, request access so that you can uh, have the advantage of the materials that are on the resource here. So Nicola's just going through the, the policy context there. So it, it highlights the reports that she mentioned earlier in this presentation. Um, and you can see that there's, there's a lot being going on in this particular um, area. Now we move on to the, the library role overview um, with the, the re really useful model that um, Liz and Andrew came up with, uh, with the holistic model for library support for mental health and wellbeing. We've got a section on student involvement, um, which we can obviously we can add more to um, as time goes along. So the idea with the resources as a total piece of work is that it's a live resource that can be added to, and particularly in, in the light of feedback from people who've, who've you know, had a look at the resource and, and seen what the areas that they found most useful. So the area that we've spent the most time on is the case studies, and they've, these have been submitted from many uh, participants and many universities, and there's a wealth of resources within the case studies. Um, you can also submit case studies yourself, so we've got a section where you can um, submit. So there's a form um, that you, you can um, submit via, um, and it's, it links you to a template um, with some easy to answer questions. So you don't need to write huge reams about each of your case studies that you'd like to submit. Um, it, there's just some 
um, helpful prompts and just to give you a brief, so you can just give a brief description um, of the, the initiative that you've launched. So I think hopefully we'll find those case studies incredibly useful and we're going to describe some of the case top, uh, studies in a second. Lovely, thanks, Fran. Hopefully I've got the slides back on the screen now. <laughs> yes, I'm doing now, yes. Lovely. Um, so the first case study we're going to share was submitted by um, Anne Archer from Newcastle University. Um, so Newcastle created Be Well at NCL, which is a collection of tried and tested books focusing on mental health. Um, I think the great thing about this, looking at the submitted template, is that the discrete collection of books was created in collaboration with therapists um, that work on campus, though their student wellbeing um, service. So it's aimed at both staff and students, um, sort of primarily students, but obviously by the nature of it being a library, it's, it's available to everyone who needs it. It's replicated in three of their campus libraries, so very accessible. And it's also on their university wellbeing app. Um, and it's linked to information which can be used within a therapy session. Um, so, so in a therapy session, sorry, it can be recommended. Um, and also it can be accessed by students themselves. So um, there's some more details on how they got this kind of started, um, which is accessible to everyone if you sign up to the resource. But this um, example in particular was picked because it's got quite a, a strong evaluation. Um, element. So with it being obviously books that you can physically take out or access online, they're able to keep account of statistics every quarter. Um, they also have evaluation postcards, which are anonymous, so they can just be submitted like when the books handed back in um, or, or just left kind of near the books. And also there's the anecdotal feedback um, given through therapists and they're in the process of trying to create a, a method or methodical <laughs> system to um, record the number of referrals and qualitative comments. So um, there's lots more information, including photographs and handily, um, you're able to get in touch with Anne if this is something that you're interested in replicating in your own library. So hopefully it's seen as kind of uh, not necessarily an easy thing. We, rec we recognize it takes time and resource to do this, but definitely um, an idea to expand wellbeing collections that might already exist by collaborating with that sort of central service. So our next case study comes from Teesside University um, and it came from, it stemmed from the Mentally Healthy Universities project that uh, we ran here as a pilot member. Um, so it came from a student who had attended one of the Wellbeing Essentials courses uh, and thought it would be a good idea if we could have some regular student support sessions that were led by students as well. So we partnered with uh, the Students' Union about this. Um, in the first iteration of it, it was co-led by um, Sinead, who was the, the mind lead at the university. But when the pilot came to an end, um, we took over um, two of us from SLS. So myself and my colleague, Lizzie, um, we sort of um, took turns to support the, the sessions um, with Madhu, who was the, um, the Students' Union Vice President for um, Welfare. So we co-hosted these sessions every week at the same time and it got um, participants to, to get involved um, with discussions about their mental health and well-being. Uh, where we've had the most peak of, of people who were joining the sessions was when uh, there was a whole um, group of, of international students who um, just joined the university and were having particular issues with all of the, the kind of starting at a new university um, and all of the issues that they had to, to contend with, particularly as international students. So I think it was a very worthwhile initiative um, and will continue in the next academic year as well. So there's more information um, that you can get if you wish to contact me, um, but it would also be helpful to, to, for you to get in touch with the Students' Union at the university as well.
So um, we've included a little bit of engagement if everyone is, uh, is willing to do that. So we've created a Padlet, which is, um, it'll open as a, a new tab in your browser and there'll be two questions there. Um, and that will be, does your university have any initiatives co-created by students? And how could you engage with students? So you might want to think about, you know, the general student population, but also any kind of minority groups, if there's anything, particular case studies that you could add to the resource. Um, and obviously we recognise that not all universities um, have a, a big ream of initiatives. So it's also the thinking about how could you engage students. So um, when you scan the QR code, um, you should be taken to that page and if you double click you're able to add a comment in there and publish it under the uh, question now with it being virtual we're not able to give you food and treats to to make you want to fill this out but we have included a lovely donut background so if you can just imagine that you know that that that'll motivate you that would be fabulous so um looking at the time i think we'll give um three minutes three to four minutes um so if we come back basically at 11 o'clock um and then we can have a look what people have contributed um you'll still be able to add to this after and we're going to summarize uh any content and we can share it with you as well um so if we can get a timer oh. Oh, so ben's asking if we have a url for the padlet as well yep yeah um we will have i'll just grab that and we can share it in the chat trying to find the chat when screen sharing. Mm -hmm. So that should be in the chat now as well if the QR code isn't working. Oh, we've got some, some comments already. Um, so I've got somebody who's saying, we try to get students involved with initiatives, but sometimes it's very difficult to engage with, um, I think, with them. Um, and I can echo that it is difficult to get student engagement often. Um, so we've got somebody from the University of Leeds who's saying student sustainability architects, and that sounds very interesting. So I'd like to know more about that. Um, and we've got another comment saying we've just started employing a student team in the library and part of their role will be in, will involve contributing to wellbeing activities, but love the idea of student led sessions. And uh, let's just move along. Uh, we've got a UX workshop with students about library artwork from the University of Leeds. Um, again, that sounds absolutely brilliant. So I'd love to know more about that. So it'd be great if you could um, contribute your case studies about those. Let's see if we've got any more. Um, how could you engage students? That question. So making the library a welcoming, comfortable environment. So I think that's incredibly important. Um, and as our speakers, uh, the keynote speakers were saying about making it a safe space as well. Um, and then got another comment saying, ask students what they would like to see from the library. So I think that's really important as well, because the library is very much a community. Um, so just getting that perspective, it's really important to get this perspective of people who use the library. Um, and then we've got, uh, we want student engagement for our leisure reading collection, but this is a project we're just starting at LJMU. So it'd be interesting to, if anyone has any ideas about how to ensure that you get that in student engagement with the leisure reading collection. So are you asking for suggestions for additions to the um, leisure reading collection? How do you monitor usage of it? 
that kind of thing. Um, uh, and somebody else has said the library can seem a bit weird post COVID, need the community feel back. And yes, I would, I would echo that as well. We've got another one that's just moved down. We have found engaging with our student communication team has really helped us raise awareness of services and initiatives. Um, so yes, it would be absolutely wonderful to hear more about the student communication team and how that operates, um, because I think it is really key to get students to, to pass on our messages um, to the wider student community as well. Um, and then we've got another comment here saying additional question, how to engage students fully when so many students are studying remotely? That is difficult um, to get that rapport with students when it's only uh, via remote means, because um, uh, I've had the experience of a lot of students who who haven't yet come back onto campus and are failing that it's, it's difficult to do so uh, and also quite um, shy of using cameras and, and such like to, to communicate. So that is difficult, um, getting that remote engagement. See if we've got any more. Oh, I like this one. We'll launch in a family room welcoming students with children. I think that's a, absolutely a wonderful initiative that, love that idea. Um, because so many students have got to um, juggle very complex lives and particularly um, with, with families. How do you um, welcome families into university libraries? So anything that, that can be welcoming like that, I think, is, is fantastic. How are we doing for time there? Yeah, I think that's a good point um, to, to move on to our third case study that we're going to share. So thanks so much, everyone, um, for contributing to that Padlet. The group will take a look at that. Um, and if there's anything in there that can help us develop the resource, um, obviously, we can action that. And again, really encourage um, those of you who want to to fill out a, a form um, just to share your good practice across the network. So um, our third case study is from the University of Salford. This was submitted by Dean Brown. Um, and this one focuses on staff wellbeing. So at Salford, they created a wellbeing staff forum event, um, which was like a wellness retreat. They came up with this fabulous theming for it. Um, so I've included one of the, the images in the case study on the screen. So um, the, the main focus was to signpost colleagues to the institution's wellbeing services, but in a more kind of fun way, instead of just listing them off and being like, you know, there you go. Um, there was actually some, some activity around it. So they came up with uh, games, quizzes, and linked this to kind of main take home points. So um, it really enabled uh, colleagues at Salford to have ownership over their own mental health and well-being instead of just having like well-being done to them. You know, they, they got the information um, and hopefully if they need to access any services, they then know how to do that. Um, so what worked well was the fun theme. Um, they had great sort of verbal feedback. They worked in a cross team group, so it brought it brought together uh, lots of different experiences um, and expertise, which you wouldn't have if you just did this in kind of isolated smaller teams. Um, and they have also included uh, links to the theming. And I should say with each of these case studies, all the people who submitted them have left email addresses on there. So if this is actually something that you would like to have a go at doing, you can directly get in touch with the person uh, that run it and then rather than reinvent the wheel you have that as a as a starting point so great example of uh, staff well-being there so um, um yeah <laughs> sorry <no. laughs> there was a pause i was filling the pause <laughs> yes. um so we're just going to talk now about some takeaways and actions um that have led from the creation of this resource. Um, so if we just move along, 
Um, so as we've mentioned, the resources had a soft launch this week. The um, staff development leads will have been circulated an email, which they will then circulate onto their wider staff with a link so you can access the resource, you can request access to the resource. We would really like some feedback on the resource or how useful you found it, whether you think some areas should be enhanced or whether the areas that, that were not included currently that you think should be added. Um, and as we've mentioned lots of times now, it would be great if we could have more case studies um, uploaded. So there is a template, as we've mentioned, and we've showed you where you can access um, the template and you can write up your case study, just brief details, um, um, and then um, upload them to the resource so that everyone within the academic libraries community um, can, can access these case studies and use them as, as a, a starting point. Um, some of the case studies have got lots of photographs within them as well, so you can get some really good visual um, clues about how to, to really promote um, the initiatives that you're hoping to either start or continue um, or modify. Um, so I think it's absolutely a wonderful resource. Um, there is also a staff event that's upcoming. Um, and this is going to be focused on staff well-being within libraries. So that's in October. Um, and further details will be circulated in due course. But I think it's something to sort of pencil into the diary that there's another um, staff development event coming up. Um, so um, thank you very much for your participation in, in today's session. It's been great that we've had um, some great feedback by the Padlet. And if, if you wish to continue um, uploading materials to the Padlet, that'd be great. Um, and as Nicola said, we're going to write that up and then we can circulate that amongst attendees and, and wider. So do we have any questions at this point? I'll just quickly say as well on this last slide, obviously, you've got mine and Fran's contact details. Um, so thank you very much for, for listening to how ALN um, and our group is supporting mental health and wellbeing. I'll also paste into the chat the link which is on the slide here, which is the one that the ALN reps um, have been sent. So this is the registration form to get access to the resource. Um, and a final note would be to say um, the hope of collating it into this resource is to kind of uh, diminish what sometimes happens, which is when kind of tokenistic events pop up. You know, it's Welcome Week and there's one well-being and mental health initiative activity and then nothing really for the rest of the year. So this is meant to be kind of part that you can dip into through the year and ensure that you're embedding, uh, you know, healthy well-being, healthy mental health into your library culture. So uh, thank you. And did we have any questions, Fran? I'll just stop screen sharing now so I can see. So we've got, um, so it's somebody who's wanting access um, to those outside of the ALN area. And I would love it to be available to the, to the wider um, community. It'd be fantastic. It's something that has been toyed with that particular question. Um, and how it would um, be made available to outside of the ALN area. Um, we're going to have to get back to you on that one, but it's it's something. It's very much an ambition that it is. It does go wider than the ALN community. Thanks very much, Fran and Nicola. That was a really interesting session and some really interesting conversations happening on the Padlet as well. So thanks to everyone who, who contributed to that. Um, and thanks as well to Tom for his session a little bit earlier in this um, slot today. So next up on the programme, we have got a little break until 11.35 in which you can network in the lounges or in the sponsor booths. And um, this will be followed by a presentation from our silver sponsors, Adam Matthew Digital and Any Book Library Services at 11.35. Thanks very much again to our presenters and to everyone for joining the session today.